everybody. <clears throat> this is Mike from Eldorado Guitars, and I'm here hanging out um, on an afternoon and drinking a little drink here and hoping that we could hang out and talk a little bit about Fender Custom Shop guitars, um, especially Strats. So, um, I am drinking a Boulevardier, in case you don't know what that is. It is basically a Negroni with whiskey, with American whiskey. So this has uh, Basil Hayden's Dark Rye, I think. Very tasty, so join me. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about custom shop guitars because I think it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, all of the options and different things that are out there with custom shop guitars. And I guess there's just a lot of things that I wish somebody had told me. You know, I just sort of wish like somebody had said like, hey Mike, you know, um, here's some things you might consider, here's some things you might like, like here's some, you know, different options you have, here's what they mean, right? And I also think people kind of tend to focus on some of the wrong areas of their custom shop guitars. And so I kind of just want to talk about that a little bit. I have two custom shop guitars with me here today. I have this one, which is my white um, limited edition 6263 Strat. And then I also have over here my trusty old 1965 Time Machine Strat, which is known as the Desert Cruiser. And I'll explain why that is um, in a minute. So um, the two very different guitars, even though they're both strats, um, and both 60s strats, um, they're a little bit different. So I'll talk about that kind of as, as we go through it. So first thing I want to talk about when you're thinking about your custom shop guitar is um, actually not things that people typically pick, uh, think of. So people typically think of things like the color, right? Or the relicking package, right? This is a journeyman relic. Um, this one is a heavy relic or super heavy relic. I think it actually says on the on the floor shop traveler. Um, and basically I think that that's kind of the wrong way to go about it. I think the first thing you should think about, and you're probably like, oh, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say the pickups and stuff. Actually, no, incorrect. Think about the neck, man. Think about the neck. And think about both sides of the neck, okay? The front and the back is very important. So first let's talk about the back. Um, the Fender Custom Shop offers a dizzying number of neck carves. It's actually like completely crazy. It's something like 30 or more neck carves. And it's really kind of impossible to know like exactly what they all mean and what they all do, right? So it's kind of a little bit weird. Um, and you kind of have to figure out what you like. And that can be really difficult because, I mean, I've owned a lot of custom shop guitars. I probably have owned like seven or so, eight maybe custom shop guitars in my life. And it took me that many guitars to figure out what I really liked in the neck, you know? So most people don't even have that, that privilege, right? Most people might get, might get one custom shop guitar, right? And so how do you get it right? So I would say, number one is obviously play as many guitars as you can play, both Fenders and Gibsons. Measure them. Take, I have like a caliper here, right? Take a caliper with you, measure it. Get the numbers, figure out like how thick is the neck at the first fret that you like? How thick is it at the 12th fret that you like? Right? Uh, measure the output of the pickups to at least get like an idea. I know that that's not a super reliable measure, but at least get an idea. Figure out, do I like Alnico 2? Do I like Alnico 5? Right? So play a lot of guitars. And I think what you'll discover with the necks is that there are basically two big categories with the back of the neck. The first is thick necks and the second is thin necks. So for Fender Custom Shop, most of the thick necks are going to be 50s necks. So it might be like a 1955 Nocaster U, it might be a 1957V, um, it might even be a 1959C, like large C or something, as they started to transition into the thinner necks in the 60s, right, and the C shape. Um, I actually like some of those, but generally I don't like the super ultra thick necks on, on strats. I usually like the thinner necks, uh, but not the thinnest. So the carve that's very in vogue right now, if you look at like retailers like Wildwood or Dave's or whoever is the 60s Oval C. I actually don't like that 60 Oval C. It's actually the Fender Custom Shop's thinnest neck carve, which they also don't tell you. And it gets very skinny down here at the first fret. It goes all the way down to 0.79, which is very small. Um, and then I think up here it goes to something like 0.93 or something. So it's a pretty skinny neck. Um, what I discovered is I like the smaller necks, but I don't like those really skinny oval Cs. This is a 63 C shape, and I think this registers 0.82 down here, and I think it goes up to 0.98 or something up here. So it's a little more substantial, right, than that 60s oval C. This one is is even um, this one is even slightly larger. This has a 1965 C, um, and I think it's 0.8 eight 
or something or 0 0.86 or something at the at the first fret so just slightly thicker and then i think it goes up to like one at the at the 12th fret so it's a little thicker so think about the carve in the back the thickness how it fits in your hand what you like the other consideration to take into account on the back of the neck is the finish so i personally like these ones that have the heavy relic neck back you can see that there right where they have taken off the finish and it's basically just like oiled wood here and this one has the same thing in fact this one's even rougher on the back this one is pretty smooth but this one is actually even rougher on the back i'll be honest i thought that was a gimmick like i thought it was a gimmick but when i played um, a guitar that had the um, raw neck back like that i was like wow this is actually awesome i actually really liked it you feel the vibrations from the string a little bit more. Um, you feel like the neck kind of rumbling, right? And I love that. And um, it doesn't get sticky um, or hot or anything. So I really personally prefer that. Um, I'll tell you from like an actual wear perspective, this is insane. No guitar wears like this. This is BS. I have a 1973 Gibson Les Paul Custom that's had the shit played out of it. It's been refretted. It's like, it's, you know what I mean? Like it's had the crap played out of it. And the neck does have paint coming off the back. But this is like almost 50 years of play, and it still isn't like this, right? So this is kind of BS, but I still like it. It still feels good, you know, in the hand. So I get why they do it. So think about that on the back. For the front of the neck, you should be thinking about not just fretboard choice. I know that's where you thought I'm going. Like, I'll go maple or rosewood. I actually think that's a little bit of an overrated decision. I do think there's a difference between maple and rosewood. I, I think that, like, you know, you can... You know, hear it like, you know, if you had two different guitars that were the same other than that, I think you might notice a small difference, you know, but I think what I would think about more than that are the frets. Nobody pays attention to the frets. Everybody just accepts like whatever frets it comes with, right? And in a way that's good because frets go through things that are in vogue, um, you know, just like neck shapes, right? Like when I was growing up in the mid nineties and learning to play guitar, uh, you know, 1995, 1996, when I was, you know, a teenager, the thin C-shaped necks for fenders were like all in vogue. So I think that's why I like the thinner C-shaped necks, right? And for frets, like the frets that were always in vogue were medium jumbos, right? Everything in 1996 or whatever had medium jumbo frets on it, right? And so um, what I've discovered though, and, and I still like medium jumbo frets and they're fine, but what I've discovered is actually I prefer smaller frets. And I think I first learned this um, two times. One, uh, my friend Rob growing up had this uh, guitar that his dad gave him. It was a 1981 Fender Lead One. And um, it had these, it just played so well and it had these tiny little frets. And I never really knew why it played so well or like why I liked it, why it was so comfortable. And in retrospect now, I think it's because of the smaller frets. And then as an adult now, what turned me on to the smaller frets was number one, the frets that are in vogue right now are what they call the narrow tall, the 6105 frets. So they're vintage width, but they're much higher. They're much taller. I like them, um, but they produce almost kind of like a scalloped feel. Your fingers will never touch the fretboard, right? Like never, ever, 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 unless those frets wear way down, right? Um, but what I really discovered was that, A, I liked those. Those were good, but I own a couple of Gibsons, um, vintage Gibsons and a couple of vintage Fenders, all of which have smaller fret wire. The Gibsons are all those like fretless wonder Gibsons. It's a 73, a 79, and an 82, right? And they all have those fretless wonder frets that are very tiny frets. And I love those frets. Man, those guitars are so easy to play, almost too easy to play. Um, and then I have some vintage Fenders. I have a 79 Strat and a 76 Tele Deluxe. Um, and they both have vintage fret wire, and I love that fret wire. So one of my favorite things about this guitar is that it actually has vintage fret wire, which these days is very rare. Almost all the custom shop guitars have either 6105 or some form of jumbo. Jumbo, medium jumbo, whatever. The vintage wire is actually relatively hard to find, if you can believe that. So um, I like this vintage wire. Um, so my advice, again, would be try and go play some vintage guitars if you can. Uh, go to like a shop and just, you know, and just say like, can I play one of those? Um, it doesn't have to be like a, you know, super expensive, but play like an early 80s Les Paul or play a late 70s Les Paul, you know, or play a Fender from the 70s. And even if it weighs 11 pounds or something, who cares, right? Just play it and feel if you like those frets. If you like that smaller fret feel, a little bit faster on the fingers, a little easier to fret um, chords and things. And... Um, I think just like feeling a little bit more of the fretboard under your fingers, not quite so scalloped, especially on these strings. When you bend them, you can really feel them like digging in. I like that feel. You may or may not, but you don't know, think about that. So for the neck, again, most important part of the guitar that I think most people overlook is the neck. Think about the back, 
the shape, the finish, and then think about the frets you want on the front. The other part to think about is obviously the pickups. Um, so Fender Custom Shop pickups are wildly imbalanced and out of whack. Um, they're trying to recreate the vintage experience. So if you've ever played a vintage guitar, you'll know that frets were much less consistent, I'm sorry, frets, pickups were much less consistent back in the day than they were today. Today they're very precise. If you buy a modern Fender, a modern Gibson, even a custom shop Gibson or something like that, right, and they're using a machine to wind the pickups, it's gonna be very standard, right? They're all almost gonna sound identical. They're all gonna sound very close, right? Now what will make them sound different is like the wood in the guitar and how it's manufactured and how the glue sits and all those things. But like, for the most part, right, like they're gonna sound very similar. But vintage guitars are all out of whack. If you've ever played a real vintage guitar, the pickups are all over the place. You could end up with an ideal configuration where the bridge is the hottest and the neck is not the hottest, or sometimes, like um, Dwayne Allman had on his Hot Lanta guitar, right? The neck was hotter than the bridge, so he actually went in and flipped them, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know, so like they were wildly inaccurate. And the Fest Fender Custom Shop seeks to recreate that experience, okay? So they their pickups are wildly um, all over the place. So um, I, I'll give you an example. So I loved this guitar, the Desert Cruiser. I loved it so much that I actually um, bought a second one. I bought a second Fender Custom Shop guitar. Uh, same thing, 65 Time Machine, bought it from Sweetwater. Um, this one, ironically, I bought from Guitar Center. I can explain it in a minute, it's wild. Uh, but I bought it from um, Sweetwater, and um, I got it, and the pickups were just absolutely not the same as this at all. Like, not even close. Like, uh, or as this, I'm sorry. Not, not even close, right? Like, not even close. I mean, this one were super low output, like 5.7. The ones I got from Sweetwater are 6.5. Um, the clarity wasn't there. Um, they, they didn't take distortion very well. They just, I'm not saying they were bad pickups. They just weren't right for me, but they were so wildly different from these when they were supposed to be the same exact model, like it blew my mind. So the Fender Custom Shop pickups are kind of all over the place. So I would encourage you to sort of like feel them out, um, really try and play it if you can play it. The next thing I would encourage you to think about are the knobs and the, the control layout. So I think the Fender Custom Shop offers a couple of different layouts. It's like Classic, Vintage Mod 1, Vintage Mod 2. Classic, I don't advise. Classic is where you don't have a bridge uh, tone control. Uh, vintage Strats, like my 1979 over there, um, does not have a tone control on the bridge pickup, and it's really painful because the bridge on Strats is really bright. So for me, I need to take that edge off of the bridge for two reasons. One, it makes the sound more versatile and it thickens it up a bit. And number two, it brings it into better balance with the neck pickup. Otherwise, like on my 79, the bridge is so shrill and bright and by comparison, the neck feels very dark and boomy. Um, I'm actually taking it to my luthier tomorrow to have them rewire it so that I have a neck and a, a bridge control. Um, so I think for me, that's important. Let me play you what I mean. I'll play you an example really quickly. So I'm going to put it on the bridge pickup. I'm going to turn the tone up to 10. Okay, so let's hear what it sounds like on 10. Okay, so like... So they call that the ice pick frequencies. So um, I like to dial the tone control back. I've dialed it down to six, right? So let's hear that on six. much more tolerable. Now I want to show you that balance, right, will improve between the bridge and the neck too. So it's still on six. I'll play the bridge and then I'm going to switch to the neck and you'll hear the difference, okay? Right? 
right? So the, the balance between the bridge and the neck is much better. And of course you can adjust it, right? You could, I have the, the, the tone on the neck at seven right now. I could bring that down a little if I wanted, if I wanted to try and darken it and bring it more, or I could bring the bridge up a little bit, like maybe to seven, like right now. And then like seven would be like, Right? So I like to have that, that versatility in the controls. That's important to me. The other thing that I would say is um, make sure you get to consider a treble bleed. So treble bleed will keep the guitar um, bright even as you turn down the volume. So normally what will happen with the guitar is if you don't have a treble bleed, as you turn down the volume, um, it will get darker. Uh, the highs will go first. You'll lose highs first. Um, and I'm not an electrician, but I think that has to do with the way the electricity is flowing in the guitars, right? It's the signal. It takes off highs first. So what a treble bleed does is it keeps the highs. Now, some people like no treble bleed because it, it will darken the guitar up. And as they roll it down, they want it to darken up, right? Like maybe vintage -y type players want to do that. I personally prefer to have it remain clear because I use a lot of distortion. And with distortion, you can typically um, keep your guitar, um, it'll keep some of the edge of the distortion as you roll down, but it'll keep nice treble frequencies. So let me roll over and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So I'll play just a little like thing here and you'll be able to hear like right here. So I don't know whether you do or not, but that's something you should think about, right? So think about like, do you want tone controls for the bridge pickup? How do you want the tone controls to work? And then second, do you want a treble bleed or some other type of thing to keep the brightness in the guitar when you turn it down? Um, so consider your pickups, consider your um, controls. The pickups in this, by the way, are 60 slash 63 Fender Custom Shop pickups. I like them. Um, I do think the neck is a little hot because remember I told you vintage pickups are weird. This is I think six in the bridge, like 5.8 in the middle, and then but the neck is something like 6.5. So you'll hear there's a little bit of a jump. I kind of should probably lower this a little bit to see if I can take it out. But still I like this guitar. So I'll play on this for just a second so you can hear kind of like what it sounds like, excuse me, what it sounds like. And then I'll play the Desert Cruiser for you so you can hear that by comparison. Okay, so I really like, um, some of the sounds I really like on this are like the number four position is really nice if you want something clean. It's really great for like those John Frusciante kind of parts, you know, like. going to turn on the, I have an Earthquaker Devices um, plumes over here, so I'm going to turn that on. The volume may jump a little, so just bear with me. Um, but if you push the signal just a little bit with something like this, you get a really nice, like, John Mayery kind of, like, breakup. <laughs> over to the gain channel and I really like the way that this bridge pickup sounds with a little bit of gain. Um, I usually put it on about like 6.5 on the tone and then you really get that Mike McCready kind of sound. Um, so let me play you something like that. Like...
guitar just is very versatile. And um, as far as single coils go, I think this is just like a really nice, versatile sounding guitar. So I love this one. Great, great, great guitar. And let's be honest too, I mean, I said before color doesn't really matter and it really doesn't and I'll prove that in a second with this uh, Desert Cruiser. But um, how cool is this? I mean, seriously, a white Strat, right? Vintage or Olympic white, mint green guard, dark rosewood fretboard. I mean, come on, dude. Like. This thing is never going out of style, right? This is as classic and as cool, I think, as it gets. I mean, this is a classy looking guitar, super badass. So I really like this guitar. Let me switch over to the Desert Cruiser and I'll explain a little bit about the story behind this guitar so you can kind of hear that. So the Desert Cruiser um, got its name because I bought this guitar when I moved to Phoenix and um, I wanted a guitar that I really didn't have to like I think it's still in tune. Um, I wanted a guitar that I really didn't have to worry about with the humidity. The humidity there is really brutal. And um, so I was on the kind of hunt for a guitar that um, wasn't super expensive, that I could just like leave out in the humidity, the low humidity, and just like let it ride, right? And that's the name Desert Cruiser, right? Because it's just gonna cruise the desert. Um, unfortunately, this guitar didn't do much desert cruising because actually when I bought this guitar, even though I had the intention to leave it out, this guitar turned out to be too awesome to leave out and suffer, although it did suffer a lot of damage at Guitar Center. Um, so I got it for sale, I got it on, at Guitar Center. Um, it was on sale, on clearance, because it was a 2018 model and it was, you know, the fall of 2020. And um, so I got it on super clearance and it had like fret sprout and things that had to be fixed because it had just sat out in the Phoenix, you know, summers and winters for two years, you know, which the humidity gets down to 10% or less. You know, I think this uh, spring in May was down to like 6% at one point and, you know, your guitar will shrink up. So um, I had some work done to it and it sounds and plays just awesome. It has the coolest pickups I have ever heard. I won't let techs touch them. When I take it in for a setup, I tell them like, do not touch the pickup heights, like leave them alone. The second I picked up this guitar, I knew it was the guitar for me. Like I, this was, it was one of those serendipitous moments where like, you know, you just knew. Like, I, and even the guy, and I know the guy at Guitar Center is, is motivated to lie, you know? But he was like, he was like, that guitar sounds right with you. And I was like, you're right. It, it really does. So I just bought it. I didn't even know how much it cost. when I, I didn't even know it was on sale. I just told him, I was like, I will take it. Now, as you can probably tell, it has a pretty wild color and a pretty wild relic, which honestly, I hate. I hate the color of this guitar. Um, I don't mind the sparkle sunburst that much, um, but I, I just hate the relicking. Like, I, it just... This, it's just too much, you know? I, I, like, if I, I love everything about this guitar. I've considered getting it painted, but I'm afraid it's gonna change the sound. But I really hate the relic job. I mean, look, the back is like all screwed up. Like, I just, I think it looks tacky. At the Journeyman, I like, right? Cause it's the right, which this one is a, is a Journeyman relic, the, the white one, right, is a Journeyman relic. And I think that that's the right amount of like wear for me on a custom shop guitar. You know, I think I'd prefer maybe even a closet classic, um, but, this just feels tacky, but this guitar sounds so good, I just don't care. So, I mean... I think maybe part of the reason I like this guitar um, is that it's dark. The sound is pretty dark. The, the pickups are pretty dark pickups. They really don't have much bite. I mean, even if I turn, like, I'll go to the bridge, right? So that's on 7. Even if I turn it to 10, like, let's turn it to 10, and I'm really going to try and do what I did with that one, right? Like... but I still don't think it's as bright as that guitar. Um, it's just, it's a little bit darker, you know? It's just a great 
sounding guitar and just great playing. The way it moves in the neck is just right. Like you can feel the strings rumble um, in the neck, you know, which is so great for like anything that's like just over the top, like, you know, like if you want to do like a like, uh, like a like kind of sort of like you know, Billy Corgan, like. some typically less Paul kind of things like crazy so I just you know you can might maybe you can even tell from the video that like it just feels right kind of like in my hands right um, so there's one more thing that I do want to share with you though before I end this video I know it's been kind of long but there's one more thing I really want to share which are my secret weapons for strats so if you want to know my secret weapons here's my secret weapons for strats so the first thing is a trick of the build so that is both of these strats have compound radius this one is uh, 9.5 to 12, and this one, the white one, is 7.5 or 7 and a quarter to 9.5. I love the compound radius because it solves the issue of fret outs up in this area. Because if you set your action any lower than even factory sometimes will cause it, right? You'll get fret outs up here when you try and bend. You'll bend up, you know, you'll bend up. And it'll choke. You'll you will not hear the note anymore. It'll physically choke out. And usually you'll get that on frets like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 on like the E and the B up here. 
compound radius solves that. So that's the first kind of like secret weapon I have is I recommend highly that you consider on a custom shop guitar a compound radius. I really, really highly recommend that. The second secret weapon that I recommend um, for my strats is um, in the setup. So I always set the bridge up kind of like, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Let me see if I flip it around. I always set my bridge up relatively flat. It's not flat, but it's very close, right? It's very close. I tell my techs that I want to be able to just barely get under here. I want to be able to put my fingers on the screws on the back of the bridge and pull those screws. So like, I'll do like, right? If it's too flat, I won't be able to get under there. So it's got to be just high enough that I can like, you know, trick I will give you um, really quickly is um, for my strats personally I move the neck which I know you're probably like whoa because <laughs> people are afraid to move the necks on their guitars but I promise you on fenders you can move the necks it's safe okay I promise you know what you're doing by the way that's a warning I used to be a lawyer a long time ago this is not legal advice please don't move your neck please don't break it if you don't know what you're doing go to attack don't do anything you don't know what you're doing but I recommend moving the neck slightly. Um, so you'll notice that the strings are not centered over the dots. I move the neck so that the bass strings come up higher here, which raises the treble spring strings higher here. Because I want extra clearance on my treble strings here. The, I don't care if I have clearance on here. Like if this rolls off, right? Like. I don't really care because when am I bending up on the low E? Never. I'm always going to bend down. Right? So I don't need that much clearance here. As long as I don't like press it up like this when I fret the note, which I mean maybe sometimes might happen now and then. But like I would rather have the clearance up here because having your high E um, slip off the board like, you know, or is really not that awesome for the most part. Um, that sounded kind of cool, actually. It's kind of neat. But um, I generally don't like that, right? So I like extra clearance up there because I tend, especially this finger on, on me, my ring finger is a very fat at the end, and so I will very easily pull that off. So I like the extra clearance. So you'll notice I shifted basically the strings over by adjusting the neck this way. Right, so all you have to do, and there's videos on this, I don't want to explain in detail here, but basically all you have to do is unscrew the screws a little bit, move it over, have a buddy hold it for you, and then screw it back in. It's really all you have to do. Or take it to your tech and just say, hey, I want more clearance on this area. Can you shift the neck over a little bit to give me some extra clearance here? It literally should take 10 minutes. They should be able to do it while you wait, right? It's that, it's that easy. So that's my other secret, secret weapon for strats. Um, I would also encourage you one more thing, which is not a secret weapon, but I think is pretty cool, is these are two different woods. This is an alder strap, and this is ash. Um, and I would really encourage you to think about getting an ash strap. I know that people think ash strats are 50s strats, right? Like the very early strats were ash, um, like the Mary Kay strats, the blonde strats and stuff were ash, right? Um, and they're great and everything, uh, but I would encourage you to think about a 60s Strat in Ash. I think it gives a very cool sound, and you can hear that on this guitar. It really sounds nice um, with, a, with a 60s Strat. So I would encourage you to just uh, think about that. All right, everybody, I'm going to play just a little bit here, and I'll send you off. If you liked this video and you want more videos, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment or something below, um, whatever it may be, something I did well, something I didn't do well, something, something, I don't care. Just leave something and uh, have a drink with me and I'll uh, check you guys out later. All right, see ya. Mm -hmm.